welcome to America's Commercial Real Estate Show, your source for market intel, forecasts, and strategies. Hello, I'm Michael Bull. Thank you for being with us. This segment is brought to you by Luma. They are an incredible financing source for you, which is what we're going to talk about today is the debt market, L-U-M-E-N-T.com. Check them out, especially if you're looking for loans for, for multifamily, for student housing, for senior housing. They're great at it. Do check them out. Well, today we're going to talk about the U.S. capital market. What are the trends there? We're going to talk about the debt market, and we have an expert with us, Jim Costello. He's chief economist with MSCI, the Real Assets Division. Jim, good to talk to you again. Thanks for joining us. Always great to see you, man. Thank you. And uh, let's just talk about, first of all, I guess, the elephant in the room, the amount of maturities coming up, obviously with these huge uh, rate increases happening so fast. Uh, a lot of these maturities are going to uh, potentially be a problem. People are going to have to put down some cash uh, uh, equity on these deals or, or work them out some way. What do you see for the level of maturities ahead of us? Yeah, working through the numbers, it looks like uh, just from what we're tracking, something close to $1.5 trillion uh, coming due uh, between now and 2026. Uh, it's... Uh, uh, you know, just a, uh, that's a lot of money. <laughs> uh, and you know, there's, there's been some maturities already in 2023. It's not always going well. Uh, but the, the amount of capital that is needed just to refinance the current investments in commercial real estate world, it's a big lumpy number. Yeah. Yes, it is. And, and it, uh, it's interesting. Uh, I was given an example the other day to a group I was speaking to and and they're like, well, what, what, what's the big difference? You know, well, why would there be challenges with this? And I said, well, I was giving an example of an $85 million property we're selling that was sold at a five cap uh, before the rate increases. Well, let's say that it doesn't have, only has 100 basis points increase in the cap when the interest rates probably, you know, doubled. Um, and so then that at a six cap, at 70 million. So you lost 15 million. Well, let's take a property type like BNC office where you probably had a 200 basis points change. You're talking about a 30 million drop in value on an 85 million dollar property. So there's going to be some some challenges ahead of us, isn't there? Yeah, and, and you know it brings up a, a data point that we looked at recently. Just when lenders, you know, something goes wrong, even a good time, something goes wrong. But in the first half of 2023, when something went wrong in the office market, uh, and a, a, an owner had to rather a lender ended up becoming the owner and had to uh, sell off the property in an REO type situation uh, after foreclosure. They uh, they lost about thirty percent of the original principal, and that's the average. You know, there's some that did a little bit better, there's some that did much worse. But if your average loss rate is thirty percent, that's not a good sign. Yeah, yeah, that that's uh, that's trouble, and it could be trouble. I think and. Really, most every sector, right? Because of the the cost of money. Well, that's the thing. I mean, you know, the best performing sector at the moment in terms of prices, uh, just the level of deal activity, it's the warehouse sector. Everybody's buying more stuff online. Uh, there's all those boxes getting packed up and shipped, and goods being stored someplace. Uh, so that sector has some demographic and uh, uh, business cycle trends going for it. But even there, you're seeing some price declines just because of the change in the capital markets environment. Even if your income is good, if your cost of debt is a lot higher now when you go for a, a new mortgage, you're still going to have some trouble. So even there, for warehouses, you know, the losses aren't as extreme when something went wrong. And again, even the best of times, something always goes wrong with a property, some property, and somebody ends up in default. Uh, but you're only looking at like a 5% loss right there. Uh, so it's not as extreme as, say, the office sector. Yeah. Well, the banks are in pretty good shape, aren't they, Jim? Can they continue just to kick the can down the road a while and see what happens? Well, at the moment, the banks are are not moving as hard as they could. There is a lot of commentary about what's happening with the banks right now. And one of the challenges that we face in our industry, uh, our sector is is incredibly opaque, uh, the commercial real estate sector. You know, as, as much as I've tried <laughs> since I started in this sort of information space around real estate in the mid-1990s, and as much as I've tried since then to help increase transparency for the sector, there's still a lot that we know that we don't know. 
uh, you know, to go back to Donald Rumsfeld's kind of uh, uh, analysis. Uh, and and you know, the, 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 the debt market is, is one of those. Earlier this year, you know, a lot of information, disinformation came out from the Wall Street Journal with a reporter saying that 70 percent of commercial real estate loans in the United States were originated by small local banks of the type that were facing trouble when you had the SVB collapse, when you had the, uh, you know, the signature bank collapse. Uh, the, the truth of the matter is the reporter just didn't have the numbers right. You know, they were looking at a survey from the Fed, a survey of banks. And he, the reporter didn't realize that there were other lenders out there, <laughs> like life companies, uh, uh, the, the GSEs, Fannie, Freddie, uh, CMBS, all those things aren't regulated by the Fed in the same way. So it just isn't in the survey. The, but it just it, it points to it's just a lot of uh, uncertainty just driven by the, the lack of transparency on market data in, in, in the sector. Yeah. Uh, but the banks, the small banks, uh, they they were uh, a big share of total uh, loan origination into the first quarter of 2023. Uh, on average, you know, it was 34 percent of all of all uh, originations were due to those small banks. And into the second quarter, you know, following and that was a record high uh, of of their share in the marketplace. In this, in, in, since we've been tracking it since 2012, but the second quarter, in the aftermath of everything that had happened with uh, all the scrutiny and uncertainty around the small banks, that share plummeted. It was a fastest drop ever hmm. for these groups, and there's usually some kind of drop in the uh, in, in, in the data, but this one was unlike anything else. Their share fell uh, to 25 percent of the market. And the really incredible thing is if I look at our data on their originations, there's normally a a, uh, a seasonal pattern. The first quarter of every year is always the least heavily traded quarter of any of any period because everyone's just coming back from the holidays. Uh, you, know, you just had a big year the year before. Now you're doing your planning in January. There's some early in the year vacations and conferences. And then everybody starts figuring out what they're going to do for the year. So first quarter deal activity is always lower. And there's a bounce up in the four, in the second quarter. And on average, small banks, their originations usually would climb 14% hmm. uh, between uh, the first quarter and the second quarter of every year. Whether it's a down year or, or a good year, it always happened. It's just, you know, you're going to do a certain amount every year. And the second quarter is always better because you're you're just uh, uh, you're coming off of uh, you know what was uh, you know kind of a slow period in the first quarter. Second quarter of this year, uh, the small banks their originations were down four hmm. percent. To me, that just screams that these groups are uh, becoming much more cautious, uh, restricting what they're willing to do. Uh, and you know, is it the case that you know these small banks are? Uh, restraining themselves based on what they went through and seeing all the other troubles at the other small banks and worrying that um, are we next? Do we need to be more careful? Do we need to reserve capital so that when the regulators do start breathing down our necks that we are are in a better position? You know, those are the kind of things that uh, uh, you know, kind of points to me. And you know, things like the senior loan officer survey from the Fed where they're trying to get the sentiment from these loan originators, that's also pointing to a point, uh, pointing to a situation where these these lenders are a little more hesitant to extend credit at the moment. It's it's not uh, it's not going to be the healthiest situation if I'm a borrower in a smaller market where most of the debt comes from these small banks. Yeah, we could create our own problem, right? With <laughs> Within the well, this is industry. and this is the problem that we've seen in in other cycles in the past. I'm not saying it's going to happen this time, but you know that that this is the risk that you get some price declines that are a function of nobody can get debt, and then because you can't get debt, uh, when something has to sell, it sells at a tremendous loss, and a lender sees those kind of uh, those kind of loss numbers. And think to themselves, well, why do I want to lend on commercial property if it's losing that much? And then that uh, becomes a vicious downward spiral. Yeah. Now we're not there yet. Okay, yeah. uh, we are not there yet. This this situation that we're in, 
Yeah, if you go to industry conferences, people say, oh, nobody can get that. Nobody can get that. People can get debt. It's just you can't get debt like you could in 2021 and 2022. Uh, you can't get the 80% LTV at uh, uh, 100 basis points uh, over SOFR. You know, it's not it's not uh, with no covenants. Uh, it, it, it's it's money that is uh, much tighter, uh, more expensive, more restrictions. But it's there. It's just, you know, at the, with the amount of money that is made available, it's hard to make a go of an investment in the current market uh, because you know, the lenders don't want to take the risk that that uh, uh, the market sees some further declines. Uh, so they're going to be really stringent there. But the current owners, uh, they're not selling, uh, willing to sell at a number uh, that makes sense relative to the debt that's available. Uh, because uh, for many of them, it would mean that they would have to take a loss. And that's just human behavior. Nobody wants to take a loss. And so we do have a bit of a hung market at the moment with much less liquidity uh, than a year or two years ago. Uh, because buyers and sellers are just too far, far too far apart on their expectations. Yeah, we've certainly seen a, a lot of that, and we're starting to see it as on the brokerage side. Now we're in the southeast U.S. It's a pretty good geography uh, market, right? And we're headquartered in Atlanta, but we're starting to see some things break away. We're, we just listed our first uh, foreclosed office building, and we sold it rapidly. Uh, we had it in contract within a month and closed it within sixty days. And then we, we're just involved in our first short sale. We're starting to see lenders kind of unload some of this stuff and, and move forward. And also starting to see some sellers that understand we're back to more historic uh, interest rates. We're starting to see a little more movement. I, I hope it keeps going. And, you know, and what do you expect for transaction volume? You, you, you know, I tell you, we're starting to see it pick up a little bit, but uh, it sounds like what you're suggesting is it, it may be a uh, slower volume uh, for a while still. Well, one thing that I can say with some confidence is that the growth rates will start looking better in the near term, unless there's some other shoe to fall and we go into an even worse economic environment in the next two months. Uh, the growth rates won't look as bad. And that's just simple math. We had excessive high volumes of deal volume, uh, excessive high levels of deal volume. In 2021 and 2022, when you know, the 10-year Treasury was at record lows, investors are hungry for any kind of yield, and we saw deal volume surge to record highs. For almost 10 months now, we've seen declines in deal volume at the pace of 60 to 70 percent on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, but that really started in November and December of 2022. Mm-hmm. It kind of bringing us to the, the pace of deal volume that we've seen on average month after month in, in 2023. And so you get to November and December of this year, and then we're, we're now in the same environment that we were at the start of this in uh, November, December of 2022. So you know, the growth rates should start to improve. Maybe it's not going to get positive. But you're not going to fall at a 70% rate or a 60% rate because we already took that cut uh, off of uh, deal activity when uh, you know people were first starting to react to a higher interest rate environment. Right. So it may look better at the end of this year, uh, but it's still you know, down from the highs. But those highs also were unsustainable and unrealistic. It's not the the level of activity that people should have really – thought that this is what the normal market is. If you look at a normal market from like 2015 to 2019, uh, the one sector that really stands out, industrial, even with the declines from 2021 and 2022, the industrial market is still better uh, in terms of more liquidity, more deal volume than the uh, than that period in in um, in the pre-COVID years. So that's that's one sector that is uh, doing well. Yeah, that's true. Well, what what is your expectation, uh, Jim, moving forward for interest rates? You think the the Fed's got a, another increase coming? Yeah, you know, if I if I could predict interest rates, uh, 
<laughs> I wouldn't be working now. I'd probably be, <laughs> I'd fly my private jet down there and just hang out with you and, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, go fishing or something. It's not, um, uh, it's, it's hard to say exactly where interest rates are going to go, but early in 2023 at industry conferences, I would hear people talking about the 10 year treasury going back down to 2%. Mm -hmm. Like they were investing in the expectation that that was what was going to happen, that we were in a temporary situation and we're just going to go back down. And I think part of it was just, uh, and I, I, I thought that was ridiculous. Uh, yeah. But I thought that that view, you know, the more I thought about it, I think that view just came from the fact that uh, people weren't old enough. Uh, they, you know, I've seen the elephant. I've been, I've been through a couple of down cycles. <laughs> uh, I worked in this industry in the years before free money. I mean, there's people in our industry now who have only worked, their whole work experience is drawn from this period following the financial crisis yeah. where we always had uh, government money just flooding the capital markets, uh, trying to suppress rates to uh, help sop up some of the problems from the financial crisis and then into COVID, uh, you know, keep everything afloat. That's over. Uh, plus, we have some structurally higher inflation at the moment. Uh, we had a period from the 90s on where inflation was more in check than it had ever been in the, the post gold standard era uh, because we had China entering the World Trade Organization and that helped uh, us to keep a lid on inflation. Uh, the Walmart effect of just uh, a much more improved supply chain helping to uh, you know, keep prices in check. You know, all the uh, information flow was easier. You know, that was important because in the past you had uh, surges in the economy when firms would say produce too many cars and then they realized they had produced too many cars. So they had to lay people off and then, and then people needed cars again and then you know, there weren't enough cars produced. And so you have these swings back and forth. That improved because of just information supply. Uh, moving forward, we can't export inflation the same way we did in the past. Uh, you know, the Walmart effect can still be in, in place. You know, we we that is one of the things that was driving inflation in the last couple of years. Uh, just you shut down the economy with COVID. Everybody's sitting at home at their couch. Uh, uh, when you have to restart the economy, you have to start up factories again. And this is the kind of inflationary spike that we saw say after the Korean War, when we had to suddenly retool all the factories from producing weapons to producing consumer goods. Uh, so it, it took time to do. And we're over some of that, but we're not over the housing component. There's still some uh, pressure on housing. It's, it's less, uh, but it's still there and it's still higher than the 2% rate of the past. Uh, so you know, th there, there's some pressure on, on rates from higher inflation, from less government support, uh, there's some some pressure there that didn't exist from 2009 forward, and it, it just tells me we have to be in a different rate environment than that period. Yeah. Well, Jim, as chief economist there in SCI, I have to ask you about your thoughts on the R word, <laughs> the recession, soft landing. Yeah. What do you expect moving forward? You know, it, it, it's it's interesting. Um, you look at job numbers. This is an environment where there are still people finding work. Consumer activity is still healthy. Uh, if we have a recession, it's going to be really the one that people were worried that we were going to have in 2019. I, I mean, in 2019, people were worried that we were going to have a recession. You go to the fall of 2019 at every industry conference, that was a lot of talk. Oh, we're going to have a recession because they're finally starting to withdraw all the liquidity that was pumped into the system to prop everything up following the GFC. And all these zombie companies that were dependent on cheap debt are going to go away. Uh, then we have COVID. <laughs> so now we're back to those conditions. Uh, so yeah. It, 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 if we if we do have a recession, that's what I think the driver uh, would be for what I'd be looking for. You know, do you have 
so many firm failures uh, that it reduces consumer spending, that it reduces hiring. Uh, but so far, it hasn't come through on that. Uh, up until last week, everybody was talking about in, in the economic circles is talking about almost in disbelief. Wow, we've achieved a soft landing. Uh, you know, the Fed uh, might be OK on this. Uh, then late last week, we had, you know, the the bond market sell off and then and then geopolitics and just the, the human tragedies in 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 Israel. Um, it's hard to know how that. Uh, Black Swan event is going to play through uh, to everything moving forward as well. Uh, you know, so it's uh, all that. You know, I, I'd still be looking for uh, signs of weakness if, if firms stop hiring, uh, if, if the job creation uh, disappears. Uh, that would certainly be a, a sign of weakness. But so far, that's still doing okay. Yeah, and the economy needs funding right needs needs lenders uh, is the scare of the community banks failing is is that over is the scare over uh you know, the the certainly the pullback that we saw into the second quarter on their originations suggests some element of fear you know mm -hmm. that could also help explain the decline that they're a bit afraid need to reserve some capital that they might suffer additional losses uh there's not been a loosening of lending standards. They're not more optimistic about business. Uh, so you know, it's it's not like anybody's suddenly optimistic about their prospects. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I, I've shared with some lenders on this show and, and when I speak at events is it seems to me as, as a practitioner uh, that this is a really good time for, for lenders as far as doing loans because they've less less competition so they probably get a better loan out of the deal. Uh, they probably have lower loan to value, uh, safer underwriting, and they don't have the uh, interest rate risk uh, at maturity. Well, at least I hope they don't. I don't I hope interest rates aren't significantly higher, say, five years from now. And then most of all, they get to build relationships. And I, I certainly saw some banks uh, and other lenders really create great relationships coming out of the Great Recession of coming out and doing loans uh, early on and, and helping people out. You know, who are the most active lenders right now? W what are sources that uh, we should think about? Yeah, you know, the, the loans written right after a downturn tend to outperform moving forward because you've seen all the price resets and then there's just uh, uh, growth moving forward. And we've seen prices declining, but, you know, there still is a gap between where buyers want to be and where sellers want to be that suggests that we might see additional price declines. So, you know, there's, there's some lenders, but it's mostly still relationship lending people that we've already worked with because people are hesitant to take on additional risks. Uh, but the, the biggest lender groups, uh, you know, despite their pullback, the small banks are still a very large group of lenders in, in, in the property markets. You know, it, it's it's just uh, it's just in some sense where they live. <laughs> that's where the commercial real estate market's at. Smaller markets, uh, they tend to dominate lending in those areas, and the, the property market has shifted. You know, since the pandemic started, away from the expensive coastal markets like San Francisco and New York into secondary and tertiary markets. And so it's the relationship banking in Kansas City, you know, in in uh, in uh, St. Paul, uh, that the local banks just step up and take take uh, take the lead there. But beyond that, and that's even after they've fallen off and on on their share. Uh, but beyond that, just below them, the the next most uh, active uh, source of debt capital are the GSEs, you know, Fannie and Freddie. Uh, and so that is an apartment market story. And that was about 26% of all lending in the first half of 2023. Now, that's great news for the apartment market that there is a stable source of debt capital there. But that does bleed over to help other property sectors because like if I'm a life company lender and I can't compete as easily in the apartment market 
then I've got this debt capital that I could deploy to industrial properties, to retail, even office properties. Uh, that uh, happens because you know they they can't do as much in the apartment sector because it's so crowded with capital from the GSEs. Uh, but but you know they're one strong leg of the stool helping keep everything else afloat in a sense if you think about it that way. Right, right. Good point. Well, Jim, what would you leave our audience with to think about? Maybe as, as a tip for if they're if they're borrowers or uh, other lenders uh, in the market where we are today. Yeah, thinking about what's going to happen next, and you know, leaving some thoughts with everybody. One danger that we face is that uh, people tend to form expectations by looking at the last bad event. Uh, they look at the last bad event that we went through and think that they any challenges we face moving forward that'll be the same event for us again the same kind of downward side of the market the same kind of uh challenges and you know that's natural human behavior uh but it doesn't always play out like that uh, what we're going through in terms of price declines and some challenges on the debt side the natural inclination that people will have is to make comparisons to everything from, from the financial crisis and to think that we'll have the same kind of problems on every property coming out of it. And I, you know, I'd be careful in when you're making those kind of assumptions. Uh, there's some different starting conditions that drove this, and uh, there's still a more liquidity in the market on the debt and equity side than during the worst parts of the financial crisis. Uh, back then, debt was often unavailable at any price. It's more expensive today, but that's just reflecting the the, the fact that there's some built-in expectations of price declines. So it's there's some changes underway. It's going to be difficult, but it doesn't have all the same features that led us to a calamity like the financial crisis. So we we you know knock on wood. Uh, we don't have everything lined up to feel the same kind of pain as then. Yeah, so I guess things are really going to be okay, right? Jim, Jim, thank you for joining us, sir. We appreciate the information. Hey, thanks for having me. It's uh, it's always great to talk with you. All right, and uh, thank you, Jim, and thank you around the country for uh, tuning in. Uh, whether you're watching or listening, thanks for uh, joining us. And until next week, be sure that you always lead, learn, and laugh, and join us for America's Commercial Real Estate Show. America's Commercial Real Estate Show is brought to you by Bull Realty. For commercial brokerage sales and leasing in the Southeast U.S., contact our show host by email at michael at bullrealty.com. By Commercial Agent Success Strategies, 21 incredible one-hour agent training videos. Learn more at commercialagentsuccess.com. By C5 CCIM Summit, three days of commercial real estate networking, learning and investing learn more and register at c5summit.realestate am by lumen for senior housing health care and multifamily financing visit lumen.com for more podcasts and videos subscribe and visit cre show.com